All right, amazing. Welcome to everyone to a, another EBFA webinar and sponsored by Naboso and by Dr. Emily. I have some great uh, offers that I'm going to be sharing with you guys on all of those companies' platforms. But our focus for the webinar today is going to be all about the ankle. Now, this is a session that I had done at IDEA, very well received. It's going to incorporate some of the new products from Naboso and hopefully help you guys get the most out of your ankles, your athletes, or your patients. If this is your first time tuning into any of my webinars, my name is Dr. Emily. I'm the founder of EBFA Global, founder of Naboso, functional podiatrist, human movement specialist. Uh, I take a uh, very integrated approach when I when I see patients, uh, very much built around establishing foot to core stabilization. I do take a fascial approach. Some of you already were typing in some questions about the Yoga U online course that I'm doing uh, based around fascial lines. So I do take a fascial based approach with all of my patients and everything that I do. If you've not read my book yet, it's called Barefoot Strong. You can get that on the Nabosa website or on Amazon. It is a super quick read, $17, awesome, quick packed book that you can check out. And then these are my social handles if you would like to follow and continue to learn about the way I treat patients. In addition, part of this webinar, I will show this again at the end, but a lot of you may not be aware that I actually have some at-home programs, which means that if you as a clinician or a trainer or a coach or you, the patient consumer at the end, has one of these, maybe a bunion, maybe flat feet, maybe plantar fasciitis, I actually have at-home programs that will allow you to treat yourself. So it takes you through a six-week program of exercises. Depending on the condition like plantar fasciitis, I take you through a two-week putting out the fire. So these are great. And if you're a clinician, you can even just get them and then use them as a recipe with some of your patients. But we'll share more of that at the end. Let's get started in our content where we are focusing on your ankle joint. Now, when you think about the ankle, I want you to focus on three key functions of that ankle. What is the stability, the mobility, and the power of that joint and that joint complex? Now, to have optimal movement, you must be able to make sure that you think of those three aspects. Do in the gait cycle, you have to have stability, mobility, and power coming through that ankle joint. So that's the way that I want you to think about optimizing ankle joint function. Okay. So again, pretty much just said this, but our goal is to understand the role of the ankle during dynamic movement and how any instability, lack of mobility, or insufficient strength will disrupt that optimal movement pattern. Let's start with my favorite part stability, the sensory side of the ankle joint. And if any of you have listened to any of my other webinars, you know that I absolutely love to talk about the neurosensory approach to human movement and the different joints in the foot and the ankle. This is, of course, going to be one of those. So when we talk about the ankle joint from a neurosensory perspective, you really want to understand and appreciate that it's really two different types of nerves. Uh, these are referred to as your somatosensory nerves. It is a combination of proprioception with mechanoception. And a lot of people will sometimes interchange these or confuse the terms proprioception and mechanoception. Now, if I were to ask any of you, let's say you sprained your ankle and you're doing an ankle rehab program, most likely there would be some sort of proprioceptive training, which is going to be standing on an Eric's pad, a wobble board, a BOSU. So you're on some sort of unstable surface that is going to stimulate the neurosensory control of the ankle. And most of those modalities are targeting the proprioceptive system, which we will see shortly, is going to be based around stretch reflexes, so stretching. Now, if you look at the joint from a connective tissue perspective, there's obviously a lot of fascial connective tissue uh, webs or 
um, kind of interconnected fibers that are occurring within the ankle joint. You have your joint capsule, you have ligaments, you have obviously tendons, retinaculum, all of this connective tissue, again, is interconnected with each other. Also, don't forget the periosteum that's actually wrapping around the calcaneus and the fibula, the different bones are wrapped with this fascial connective tissue web. And these, this web is packed with sensory nerves. In fact, your entire myofascial web has over 100 million sensory nerves, 100 million. So when you think about fascial tissue, I really want you to think of it as this extension from your brain. So every joint and the control of the joint, the stability of the joint is really this extension extension of your brain into that joint. And it's fed by all of that connective tissue. Again, most people will, re will refer to this as proprioceptors. There are proprioceptors that are found in the joint capsules and the ligaments and the retinaculum. These are most commonly referred to as your muscle spindles, your GTOs, and they play a very important role in providing what's called joint position sense joint position sense. Now, if you think of the ankle and someone walking and let's say the prevention of an ankle sprain. So the prevention of an ankle sprain is going to be based off of the perception of that joint, which is joint position sense, right? Now, I often say that a joint is only as stable as the rate at which it can perceive a shift in the joint, right? So perception, timing of perception is very important. So when you rehab ankles, if you happen to work with athletes or patients, when you are rehabbing the ankle, you also want to be thinking about the timing of perception of a shift in that joint, making sure that it is micro perturbations is a larger perturbation. So we want to make sure that we get this vast transfer to functional movement. And this is really built around what's called joint centration. I apologize, there should be a T there. Joint centration. Any centered joint is essentially a joint that is aligned, centered, and you have cartilage over cartilage. What I also want you to think about is center joint, in addition to cartilage over cartilage, and it's aligned, is you have balanced tension across this entire connective tissue web. Having a balanced tension around that connective tissue web creates a very rapid perception of a shift, right? So we want to have balanced tension around our joints to maintain centration. We want to have balanced tension to create a very rapid perception of a shift in joint position sense. Okay. You can use different modalities to assist in this. This is where kinesiology tape comes in. This is where ankle bracing can come in. Is you're essentially trying to stimulate the neurosensory system through the fashion, through the skin, to then accelerate the timing at which that shift in the joint is sensed. Got it? All right. And then finally, kinesthetic awareness is just the perception of a, a body or a mass moving. And then Perineal reaction time is what most unstable surfaces are training. When you're on a wobble board, a BOSU, a Dyna disc, you are training perineal reaction time, which is based around a stretch reflex. So if you are standing on a wobble board, let's say, and you are going onto the lateral side, so you're inverting the foot, you will then stretch your perineal tendons, the muscle spindle GTO, and it's based off of perception of that stretch, followed by the reaction, the motor reaction of that sensory perception. This is always inherently delayed status post ankle sprain. And people who have repetitive ankle sprains oftentimes have chronic delayed perineal reaction time. And that's where a lot of the rehab and research goes into with chronic ankle instability is what are the different techniques to hopefully increase perineal reaction time. I just want you to appreciate that that is a proprioceptive response. 
Okay, so then if we look at the other type of somatosensory input, this is going to be mechanoceptive. Mechanoceptive, for anyone who follows my work, you know that this is going to be my favorite part of the nervous system because these are the nerves that are found in the bottom of the feet, the palm of the hand. These are your touch receptors. This is what Naboso is based around. But if you've never heard this before, then this is how you can think about mechanoceptors. You have four main mechanoceptors. You can see them on the slide. You got SA1, SA2, FA1, FA2. The SA is slow adapting, which means it's constantly reading the environment. Your FA are fast adapting, and these will respond to a stimulus and then shut off, respond and then shut off. So they are triggered by dynamic movement. They would be triggered by ground reaction forces because we can see what they are sensitive to vibration. And we perceive impact as vibration. So this is a very important aspect of dynamic control of the foot and ankle complex is being able to perceive fast adapting mechanoception, which is vibration. Okay. Now the other ones, SA1, SA2, slow adapting, these are primarily used in what's called quiet stance. So when we stand in one place, we balance on one leg, that is quiet stance. You are static, foot is plantigrade on the ground, and you are essentially reading two-point discrimination, sometimes that's texture, and then skin stretch. Skin stretch can be with tape on the bottom of the foot. So I actually like to put kinesiology tape on the bottom of the foot. That's a great way to bring in skin stretch. It is also uh, stimulated when you think of horizontal ground reaction forces, and even sway has a little bit of a skin stretch component to it. Now, I always have to share some interesting foot facts because it's just part of my passion with the feet. But when we think about mechanoception, and I want all of you, if you've heard this before, you should be able to teach this slide then. So some of those interesting facts, up to 80% of the mechanoceptors in the bottom of the feet are sensitive to vibration. 80%, 80% of these mechanoceptors are actually corpuscles, FA1, FA2, which means, again, 80% of the bottom of the foot is sensitive to vibration. That is the most important stimuli that is coming in through the feet during dynamic movement. And that's essentially how we relate to the ground. So we use vibration to know how hard we strike the ground. We use vibration to trigger our loading response. We use vibration to build foot strength. We use vibration to build bone density. We use vibration to maintain balance dynamically. So a lot of really powerful stuff with vibration. Obviously, if you put cushion in your shoes, think of like a hoka, you are taking away that vibration that has all of those benefit uh, stimuli that results. Now, the peak sensitivity of these mechanoceptors in the bottom of your feet is age 40. By the time you are 70, you need twice the stimulation to create the same response. So ankle stability, joint position sense, um, ankle sprains, falls related to delayed perception of the ankle, all of that increases with age. And it has to do with that shift in the sensitivity of the peripheral nervous system. So how can we include that? Definitely think about surfaces you train on. Are you using thick cushion shoes with some of your clients or individuals? And then of course, think about using products like Naboso to help stimulate these nerves. Okay. Now, most ankle rehab and stability training is proprioceptive. You, you look at like a classic physical therapy approach to rehabbing the ankle, I almost guarantee it's going to involve standing on one leg, possibly standing on one leg on an Eric's pad, a BOSU, a wobble board, a Dynadisc, one of those surfaces. But I want you to remember that Ankle stability is a combination of proprioceptive input with mechanoceptive input. And here you go, guys. This is the biggest takeaway is that 
Remember that the control of our body dynamically in space is based off of timing. Everything is about timing, the timing of the perception of the shift of center of mass, the timing of the activation of the glutes, the timing of the activation of the foot muscles, the foot to core, the lateral line, right? Everything has to do with time, 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 time. So here's another one. Between mechanoceptors and proprioceptors, the nerves that respond the fastest to stimuli are your mechanoceptors. So when I work with ankle sprains, I always, if I'm sending them to physical therapy, this is especially in the days of like paper prescription pads that they don't really have anymore, but I would write in bold and underline, all ankle rehab must be barefoot. Like I need them out of their shoes and I would actually not want them on Eric's pads. I would rather have them on a hardwood floor on one leg and perturb them in a different way. I'm going to show you some of those ways as well. But we want to remember that our ankle stability is not just the basis of perineal reaction time, which is what a lot of these modalities are training. How do we also get the bottom of the foot to be activated? Okay, this is a huge reason of why at Nabosa we developed the kinesis board, which is a wobble board, but it is a mechanoceptive with the texture and proprioceptive with the wobble. So it's a combination board and way to train ankle stability. It also has our micro wobbles. So these are one inch foam pieces that will create a micro perturbation versus this large grandiose instability, thinking of like a classic uh, wobble board, or if you turn the BOSU over and you have the black side up, just think about how unstable that surface is. We're really trying to create a micro stretch reflex with the kinesis board. Okay. Now, before we would ever get you on the kinesis board, before ever we would start doing single leg exercises, we always want to make sure that the client, the athlete, the patient understands how to set their base. This is always my foundation to balance training or ankle rehab programming is get your foot in a stable base before we do the rest of that programming. So that is what I'm going to then show you guys now is I'm going to take you how take you through how I set the base for my patients. And then once we go through kind of appreciating this inversion, eversion, setting the base, I'm then going to show you how I do a couple activations, including the forward lean. Okay. So I'm going to hit play on this. I'm going to hype myself so that you guys can stand up and focus on what we are doing here. Finding neutral in our feet is really important when it comes to building a strong foundation and getting the most out of foot to core sequencing and the bare exercises. We just reviewed the movements of the subtalar joint, inversion and eversion. So now we want to understand how we can help the clients and members find neutral. This will be the most important when it comes to someone who has an overpronated, everted, or flat foot. So if you can see my feet, I'm going into an everted position. So if I'm standing like this, where I'm collapsed down, I want you to appreciate how my knees are going inward. This is called valgus, and valgus has an internal rotation element to it. So my tibia is internally rotated as I stand everted. If I were the client or member, and I was trying to balance on one leg with an everted foot, do you see how that breaks my foundation? So it's going to be very difficult for me to try to balance on an overpronated foot. This is a really important concept when it comes to overall movement improvement with the clients and members. So we wanna understand how to help them find neutral. So finding neutral is really pulling yourself out of this internally rotated position so you can get into that neutral, stable, foundational position. I like to have the clients and members start by feeling how their foot moves from eversion to inversion. I want them to see how my legs move inversion and eversion. 
Do they see and feel the internal rotation? Can they see and feel the external rotation? Can they go back and forth and feel that there is a spiral that starts from the foot and goes all the way into the hips? This is important because when you correct or you find neutral in an overpronated foot, you want to do it from the hip. So let's say you have the client in an overpronated position. I want them to feel that if they corkscrew and rotate out all the way to the hips, keep the heel on the floor, keep the toes on the floor, but rotate through the hips in this external rotation spiral. And then if they were to release, most of them would go right back down, right? So the toes are down, the heels are down. They can start to feel this rotation all the way into the hips. That is them finding neutral. You want them to feel what that feels like. And then again, I like to emphasize, if you just let this go when you fell into gravity, where would you go? Most of them go like this, okay? If they're having a difficult time feeling that spiral, Sometimes you'll feel or you'll hear a cue about tearing the ground apart. So if the, you imagine that there's a sheet of paper or I'm trying to split the ground underneath my feet. I'm keeping my toes and my heels on the floor, but now I'm pulling out, right? Do you see how that kind of gave a little bit of a lift to my feet and to my arch? I'm less in favor of that cue because that's more of an abduction moment, an abduction moment than a rotation. So the rotation that comes all the way up, squeeze the glutes, the glutes are external rotators, that will help them to find neutral from the transverse plane or from a spiral that runs from the feet all the way to the hip. And then they are ready to do the bare workout Perfect. Great. So on that, that finding neutral is extremely, extremely important. That is actually the first step to understanding how to set your base when you are doing any balance exercises. For the rest of that, I'm actually going to show you now, and I'm going to make myself bigger so you can see my feet. So I am here and we just appreciated the spiral right? So you got to get your foot into that neutral position. The rest of setting your base is going to be step two, you're finding your foot tripod. First, fifth heel, lift your toes, spread them out nice and wide, place them back down onto the floor and make sure you keep that external rotation moment into the hips. Now, the final part of setting your base for your balance exercises is that your toes have to be in contact with the ground, which is called purchase. So toe purchase, I like to demonstrate that through an exercise called a forward lean. With a forward lean, I would have every one of you are doing this with me now, which I hope you are. Your hands are going to be by your side. Your feet are exactly as we did it, right? So externally rotate, foot tripod, spread your toes. And now you're going to stand nice and tall and imagine that you are stiff as a board. Staying nice and tall, stiff as a board, you're going to slightly lean your body forward, hence the forward lean. Then bring it back into a vertical position. Lean forward and then bring it back. Lean forward and then bring it back. Do you notice that every time that you slightly shift your body forward, that your toes, boom, engage into the ground? So I use that as an easy exercise for the client or the patient to connect to digit activation. Theoretically, you can call this short foot. Yes, this is short foot as well. But this engagement of your toes to the ground is very important to a stable base. So if I were to then do a balance exercise, I would set my base, slightly externally rotate my foot, my toes are in contact with the ground, just like with that forward lean, and then I'm going to bring it into my single leg balance here. So this is very important. If I am in that pronated foot, I'm not in a stable base, which means the stability and the centration 
of my ankle joint is actually, it's not centered. It's not in a position that's going to optimize proprioceptive stimulation and mechanoceptive stimulation of the foot. Now, if your client has a hard time doing that, that is where, honestly, why we develop the wedges at Nobosos because one is giving them the tactile feedback and then they're angled in a way that we can use them, rotate slightly, we can use them to hold the foot in the position that we need when we do these different exercises. Now I have a neutral foot, so obviously you're not gonna see the movement with my foot, but you have a 25 degree angle. Sometimes people will use that on the inside of the foot depending on how pronated the client is, or this is a 10 degree, and then you could use that as well. But it's a really great way to help get that foot and ankle centered to set the base so that we could do the rest of the balance exercises. And then with our kinesis board, you're essentially doing the same thing. So the kinesis board has the foam pieces on the back. You can move these into a position that is challenging for you. So I moved into another position. And then I am going to, just turn this, I'm going to set my base center on the board. And then I'm going to find neutral in my foot. Toes are in contact with the ground. And then I'm going to bring it up here. Okay. And now you can see that I have this micro perturbation that is stimulating the proprioceptive system, but I have the mechanoception on the bottom, which is waking up the nerves in the bottom of the feet. Okay. So that is how we want to start to create that stimulation. What I'm going to do is pull up this again. So this mini series is something that you can do. Now, this is how I perturb people who are, um, where I'm trying to build that stability without going fully onto an unstable surface or onto a more challenging surface. So let's say if your client athlete, you have sufficient ankle stability when you're standing on one leg flat ground, doesn't mean that you have to go on to something more challenging. It doesn't mean that if the Nebosa with its micro wobbles is quote unquote easy, that you should therefore go on to, you know, the full Bosu upside down or something like that. Challenging ankle stability can be in other ways. So the way that we demonstrate these, this is actually a video that's on YouTube. I will talk you guys through it, but it is on YouTube and is part of how we then build the programming around the kinesis board. So the first way that we do that, and you can kind of stand up and try it if you would like, the first way that we do it is built around 10 second balances. So can the client, can you do a 10 second balance on one side? And then we're going to switch to the other side. So I'm keeping it around 10 seconds. Now, the reason why I don't really ever go a long period on one leg is because I'm trying to stimulate the nervous system, not fatigue it. So I want to stimulate, get to the other side, stimulate, get to the other side. So I do 10 second balances. Sometimes I'll extend it a little bit more um, to 30 seconds, or I actually have a lot. You heard me say bear. So I have a lot of barefoot balance training programming, which would involve something like a side lunge to a single leg stability, a side lunge to a single leg stability. So there are transitions into a single leg stance versus, um, you know, a minute of single leg squats on one leg. I would actually have it be dynamically transferring in and out of a single leg stance, if that makes sense. Okay, so the way that I like to challenge stability, the first one is 10 second hold, setting the base on the kinesis board. 10 seconds, great, do the other side. If you need to use the wedges when you're on the kinesis board, by all means, put that client in a stable base. Second is going to bring in a visual perturbation. So staying on the kinesis board, foot stable, core engaged, what you're going to do is you're going to take your eyes, don't move your head, and you're going to look to the right, look center, look to the left, 
look center, look to the right, look center, look to the left, look center. Okay, that's option A. Option B, which will be more challenging, is going to be having the client look right, look left, look right, look left, look right, look left. So based off of the level of stability in the client, excuse me, you would want to break it up and spot to the right, spot center, spot left, spot center, spot right, right? So we're, we're kind of breaking it down to make it easier for the nervous system. As they get better at that, then you can have them essentially go right, left, right, left, more like a saccade, okay? Your third perturbation or your second perturbation is going to be the vestibular system. So the vestibular system, my eyes stay totally straight and you are going to move your head slowly as if you are saying no, okay? And the vestibular stimulus is more about, think of it kind of like a rock, like this versus I'm trying to go as far. It's, it's not about the range of motion. You're just trying to almost like a little pendulum that's tapping the nervous system, okay? Second round, you would essentially go up, sorry, eyes have to stay straight, up and then down, like you are nodding, yes, okay? And again, it's more about a rock to the nervous system than going all the way up and then all the way down, okay? That would be your second perturbation. Third perturbation that I have people do is something that is dual tasking based. So count uh, 100 backwards and multiples of three, five, seven, pick a number, um, have them spell words backwards. Sometimes I'll have them explain how they get from one location to another. You're just trying to get them into some sort of cognitive task while doing the balance exercises. So those are the four ways that we try to get people to build the stability. Kinesis board, just balance, stable, a visual perturbation, a vestibular perturbation, and then a dual task perturbation. If they essentially pass all of those, then I would look at making the bottom of the kinesis board more challenging where we have advanced wedges. So you can make the instability greater with the kinesis board if you would like. Okay, so that's the way that we like to do the perturbation. And that is looking at your foot and ankle from a neurosensory perspective, bringing in that combination of proprioception with mechanoception. Now, real quick before I go on to joint mobility is a way that you could essentially hack the system to get more out of the kinesis board, let's say, is you could do some sort of kinesiology taping or rock taping. I would rock tape the lateral ankle into the perineal and then be barefoot on the kinesis board. So I'm, I'm trying to help the nervous system. Any of these hacks are absolutely perfect and fine to do as long as you understand the why in your programming, okay? I'm going to be doing questions at the end. I see that there's a lot of questions that are coming in. Um, so definitely type those in if you do have questions as it relates to the stability, to the proprioceptive and mechanoceptive stability. Let me just super fast. Let's see. Let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry, you guys, I'm just trying to see if there's any that are in there. Okay, so great. So all of those, oh my God, all of those I'm going to leave towards the end. I just want to make sure there wasn't like a dire, like, oh my God, where's the wedge go? Okay, great. That's your neurosensory. Let's get into our biomechanics where we are talking about joint mobility. Joint mobility, I know this is going to be a hot topic for many of you because of our need and our, our desire to optimize ankle dorsiflexion. So here we go. We're going to be talking about mobility, limited mobility. Now, when we look at the foot and the ankle from a biomechanical perspective, your ankle joint, your ankle joint is actually part of a complex with your subtalar joint. Your ankle joint is formed by your tibia, your fibula, your talus. So tib, fib, talus make your ankle joints. There's a mortise. That's the talus sitting in the mortise. 
Your mortise is formed by your tibia and your fibula make the joint itself. And then the movements of your ankle joint, the ones that we focus on primarily are extension and flexion or dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, right? Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, which is a sagittal plane motion. Now your ankle joint does not move in just the sagittal plane. Your ankle joint, it actually moves in all three planes, but it moves primarily also in the transverse plane. And the way that I like to teach this to appreciate it is if you guys were to take your right hand, so I'm going to take my right hand and I'm grabbing my right ankle bones, my malleoli. So I'm grabbing, let's see if I can balance, I'm grabbing my malleoli, okay? So as I'm standing here grabbing my malleoli, my thumb is on my inside ankle bone, which is my tibia, and then my pointer finger is on my outside ankle bone, which is my fibula, so tibia fibula. Now, if you just shut your eyes for a moment and you keep palpating your malleoli, can you appreciate that your tibia or the inside ankle bone is sitting higher than your fibula? Can you appreciate that? And then keep your eyes shut, keep feeling. Do you feel and appreciate that your tibia is sitting in front of your fibula? So if we were to bisect your malleoli and create your ankle joint axis, do you feel or could you see how it actually sits oblique? It sits like this, okay? Now, this is important. If your ankle moved in just the sagittal plane, your malleoli would actually be parallel to the ground, okay? And it would be like a hinge. Your ankle is not a hinge right? It's actually oblique and it's a little bit angled like this. What this means is that if we follow the axis, when we go up, we actually go out. And then when we go down or plantar flex, we actually go in. So there's an element of dorsiflexion out. And what is out? Out is abduction. So up and out is dorsiflex abduct. Down and in is plantar flex, a deduct. And that is actually how your ankle likes to move. Now, the dominant joint or the dominant plane of motion is going to be sagittal. The dominant is sagittal. That's what we focus on. That's what we want. Dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. Now, why I say this is that if you, your client, the athlete, does not have sufficient sagittal range of motion, the joint is going to move in the next plane, which is transverse, which means it's going to abduct or adduct. Let's take a look at someone who is squatting. And in this example, let's say they have insufficient ankle dorsiflexion, which is insufficient sagittal plane of motion. So we're looking here. This is the guy on the right. We can see that they are not going through that joint. They're actually collapsing in. And if you look at the creases on the ankle, do you see these creases on the outside of the ankle? That's essentially telling me that they're going around their ankle or they are abducting that ankle when they are squatting. Obviously that abduction, really he's pronating is what's happening, but the abduction is what's happening in the ankle, creates the internal rotation, which is what I was showing on that finding neutral video, right? So we're getting a lot of jamming in the lateral gutter. We're starting to strain a lot of the tissue on the medial side. And then obviously this is no good for the knees. Okay. What we want to look for when someone moves through their ankle, sagittally, optimally, is that the creases of the ankle joints are in front of the joints. So always look at that joint. How are they moving through the joint? Are they actually moving through that joint? Or is there some element of compensation? Okay. And then you can just easily remember that based off of dorsiflexion, abduction. If they can't dorsiflex, they're going to abduct. They're going to take that range of motion out of the transverse. Okay. So again, optimal ankle movement, sagittal. If you see excessive transverse compensation, right? Same thing that I just said. So when we think about functional movement, functional movement, which is of course, my goal to achieve walking range of motion. In order to walk the right way, you need at least five degrees of dorsiflexion. That is it. 
five degrees, which is not a lot, not a lot. And when you think about during the gait cycle, where do we need that range of motion? We actually need that five degrees or maximal range of motion when you are in late mid stance. So what this picture is here, the black leg in the back, that's essentially late mid stance. And that is where we would need five degrees of dorsiflexion. If you don't have five degrees, you will compensate. Okay. Now walking range of motion is not the same as squatting range of motion, which is why I am a huge advocate of fitness professionals, coaches, trainers, physical therapists, everyone to not just do a squat assessment on their clients and athletes, but to also do a gait assessment. And that's actually why through EPFA Global, we have part of our BTS level two is all about gait and gait assessment. We need to be able to, to assess gait. So if we look here, just as an example, this is how a lot of people will assess the gait or assess the ankle is on the right. So we can see here, he's, his knee is bent, he's against the wall, he's showing how far his knees can go past his toes. Good job, right? He's saying, look how awesome my ankle range of motion is. However, that assessment does not transfer to gait because if we look over to the left, the left leg, on the left side is really the position of how we actually need that range of motion. The hip is extended. This guy's hip is flexed, right? That knee is extended, knee is flexed, right? So we need to be in a position that's actually mimicking the connective tissue that's going to contribute to potential ankle tightness. And it's really gonna be a lot of that posterior chain. Right. So I encourage you, if you are using a squat as an assessment for ankle mobility, you're doing an overhead squat, you're doing some of the uh, FMS and different assessment screens that are out there. Do make sure that you are transferring the way that the joint needs to move in all the various movement patterns that your client needs. Specifically walking. Right. So we need to do that gait assessment and determine that. All right. So let's say if you are noticing that your client has insufficient ankle range of motion, let me just go back here real quick and tell you this. Let me just tell you real quick the compensations if you do not have enough dorsiflexion. Let's say walking. This would also be squatting. But let's say they're walking, they're going to turn their feet out and walk like a duck. Anyone who walks with their feet turned out almost inevitably, you can assume, has some sort of limited ankle mobility. Second one that you might start to see, I actually have to demo these. I'm, I love demoing these. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So you are going to have someone is walking, they're going to walk with their feet turned out, right? That's often an indicator that they have tight ankles. Second one is if you look at my back leg is let's say if I get, I hit a wall, I can't go through my joint. So I go around my joint. I just pronated essentially, right? But then I come back into this position and I take a step. So I go like this. So it's a dynamic pronation that we see. This is called a pronatory snap, okay? And as someone's walking, so they'll essentially walk like this, okay? And that's how you would see them. That's called a pronatory snap. The third one is that instead of walking with the feet turned out the entire time like this, they walk straight, but then they spin their heel in every time they hit that limited ankle dorsiflexion. So that is called a cigarette twist. They're going to essentially go like this. Cigarette twist is what that one is. And then the fourth and final one, it's a little bit hard to tell without seeing my whole body, but they're going to walk like this. So they have a very bouncy gait that is called an early heel lift. Okay, those are your four compensations for a limited ankle dorsiflexion. So let's say if you see any of those patterns, squatting, you notice a similar pattern, right? You might be saying, well, oh my gosh, how do I fix it? What is the cause? The cause of the limited ankle dorsiflexion is not always the same thing, right? What my reason is, is not going to be the same as maybe Allison's or John's, right? 
So there are sometimes soft tissue reasons. There are sometimes osseous or bony reasons for the limited ankle dorsiflexion. Now the big soft tissue ones, tight soleus, tight gastroc, right? We have to be able to differentiate between the two calf muscles. And the way that you do that is through what's called a silver scold test. So a silver scold test is essentially comparing ankle dorsiflexion with the leg straight with the knee bent. And if you get an increase in ankle dorsiflexion with the knee bent, you know it's the gastroc that is tight. Okay, so that's called a silver scold test. You could have a hypertonicity of your posterior group, hypertonicity, like a spastic posterior group. Anytime I have hypertonicity, I use vibration as a way to create relaxation in that muscle. So I like to use a vibration platform. I have a power plate over on that side of my office. And then you can also use vibration-based rollers, things like that. But hypertonicity, I really like to go after uh, with vibration. They may have this fourth one, a structurally short Achilles tendon, a structurally short Achilles tendon. This is one where everyone's Achilles tendon is like a different length. Part of that is just genetic or hereditary and a structurally short Achilles tendon. I see this a lot in sprinters. Uh, I see this in people who have an early heel lift. Anytime I see someone with an early heel lift, that's that bouncy gait. I ask them if they were toe walkers when they were children. So sometimes children can have a structurally short Achilles tendon um, because of that. And that is one that you can stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch, and you will never lengthen that Achilles tendon. That is one where surgically they would probably offer doing an Achilles tendon lengthening. Okay. So that's that's that one. Uh, for osseous, you could have some spurring on the front of the ankle. That could be from arthritis. And then the big one is going to be an anteriorly shifted talus, an anteriorly shifted talus. Now, fun fact for you guys is that the talus is the only bone in the foot with no muscle or tendon attachment. Again, the talus is the only bone in the foot with no muscle or tendon attachment, which means what's keeping it stable is ligaments. And if you sprain your ankle, you sprain your ankle many times, the chance of each successive ankle sprain fully tearing these ligaments increases. And then you, of course, can have instability and then that talus can shift forward. When the talus shifts forward, essentially your talus is here and your tibia is here, and it essentially hits a bony block. It can't go forward. Your talus needs to go back here, so then you can dorsiflex, or you would dorsiflex this way, right? But if the talus shifts forward, bony block can't move. So the technique here is going to be built around recentering your talus into the ankle mortis. Now, this technique is very important to do the right way. I'm going to just show this. Don't worry, this is recorded, remember, so you can like view this again. I have it on YouTube, so you can view this many times if you would like. Very important here is you want to make sure that your foot is neutral. That is why I emphasized that in the beginning with our neurosensory side of the ankle. You want to make sure that your foot is higher. Do you see how she is in a chair? I'm using a monster band. The monster band is going to be placed below the malleoli. Very, very important. And then the angle of pull is going to be down and lateral. Okay, down and lateral. So I'm not just pulling back, I'm pulling down and lateral because that's the angle of your tailor neck. So we're essentially matching that. You're then going to translate, oh, my apologies. You're gonna translate your tibia forward slightly. So just a 45 degree angle slightly while pulling down and lateral, keeping the foot in neutral. I would wedge that. If I were you, keep that foot in neutral. If they, every time they shift their tibia forward, they completely collapse into pronation. I'm sorry, you guys, you are not ever going to recenter that talus because as soon as you pronate and you unlock the foot, that talus loses that centrated position. So really important. I, I actually really like the wedges when doing this exercise. Okay. Now, if they have a sprained ankle, 
or sorry, torn ligaments because of sprained ankles or are a dancer and they have ligament laxity from doing points and a lot of plantar flexion and stuff like that, that talus is going to slide right back out right? There's nothing holding that talus centered. So you may need to do this posterior tailor mobilization every day before you train or before your athletes train. I worked with a lot of dancers in New York, and this would be part of their Warm up essentially is that we would do all of their mobilization. We would recenter the talus. We would do some proprioceptive stimulation. And that's part of how they started their practice right? So really important on that technique. What I'm going to do is send everyone a direct link to that video. Actually, all of the videos that are in this PDF is going to be emailed to everyone who signed up to this or for this. If you're listening to this recorded months after this has been, just reach out and I'll send you any recordings. Okay. Now, another super important part of ankle mobilization is to release the soft tissue that could be restricting your ankle mobility. And this is where I go to my favorite foot release, which is going to be your five point neural ball release. If you have not tried this release, you definitely want to check it out. This is our neural ball. This is green. This is coming out in holiday 23, but this is a green neural ball. They're blue on the website. And this is going to be used to release your feet. I'm going to show you the five points on the video. And then we're going to keep moving on because guess what? I got one last little subsection. That's the power. And I do want to respect everyone's time. So here, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you where those five points are. So right here, you can see the five points. So point one is going to be at the heel. Position number two is going to be the middle of the foot. Position three is the ball of the foot. Position four is the lateral right under the cuboid bone. And then number five is going to be the medial arch technically under the navicular, uh, if you want to be really precise on those. And then you are essentially, let me see, I'll get that neural ball open. So you're placing the ball on the floor. And then you'll put your heel on it and the ball will actually split open. So you will get that. And then you're going to stand on the neural ball on each of these points. You want to hold each point for 30 seconds. So you got five points, 30 seconds per point. You can do one foot at a time or you can do both feet at a time. But we are using this to mobilize the soft tissue on the bottom of the feet to then support ankle mobility. So what I would do from a programming perspective is I would do the neural ball release. I would do the ankle joint centration that I just described to you. Then I would pull out the kinesis board and go after those exercises. Okay. That's where we can start to think about that programming. This is going to be the video that I'm going to share with you guys Ooh, all the way down here where I'm actually talking through how I'm setting them up, how I'm pulling the band, how you want them on here. This is on YouTube, but I'm going to, again, send this to all of you so that you can see that mobilization. I'm just going to show her translating her tibia forward. So you can see how she translates that tibia. She's staying in neutral the entire time. I need to make sure that she does that so that she doesn't collapse down and pronate. Otherwise, the results are not going to be there, right? Very, very important when you're doing that. Okay, there are a couple other techniques here. I'm pulling the tibia forward versus pulling the talus back. So this is another option. And then I actually show finally the last one. I'm doing a combination. The combination one, there's no translation of the tibia. My right hand is pushing forward while my left hand pulls the tibia posterior. So I'm doing both of the actions essentially at the same time. And then I'm holding there. Of the three, that this third one that I'm doing right now gives the best results according to the patients and the clients that I work with. Okay. Still going lateral when I do it. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is get into that last topic. So here's obviously our release. Let's get into our proprioceptive power. So the final way that I want you to think about the ankle is that it is also part of becoming a rigid lever. It's part of how we release power. 
Now, optimal power from the ankle requires this 50 degrees of plantar flexion. So when we push off, of course, if we look at the foot, hopefully you guys are already thinking, what about the big toe though? You also need the big toe range of motion. You do. Right now, we're of course talking about the ankle and we need 50 degrees of plantar flexion to optimally release energy and transition out of our push off phase. So you must be able to plantar flex. Now, what happens is that every time we plantar flex, this is uh, foot biomechanics 101, and you could stand up and kind of try this with me. But if you stand with your feet shoulder width apart and you move to the outside of your feet, so you're moving to the outside, you should feel that that's what creates external rotation. We did that in the finding neutral video, right? Now, where we actually do inversion functionally is if you go flat on your feet again and then do a calf raise. So lift your heels. Right now, that position of plantar flexion, your heel is technically inverting. And when you invert and plantar flex, that creates a external rotation spiral up your lower extremity. So that spiral all the way up is really how you achieve power at push off. Now, if you, your client, the athlete cannot plantar flex sufficiently at push off, you are not going to get sufficient inversion, which means you will not get sufficient external rotation. So power at push off requires this plantar flexion moment. Okay. Now, what determines plantar flexion in our clients and in our athletes is ligaments. So there's a lot of ligaments on the front of our ankle here that have to be flexible enough. Obviously, if your muscles, right, you have the anterior muscles, tendons, and then your talus again. So when I am trying to achieve an optimal plantar flexed position, I need to make sure that they have play with their talus so that posterior Taylor mobilization that we just did for dorsiflexion, I also do it for plantar flexion because your talus actually has to be able to move like this when we move into extreme plantar flexion. If you take a look at the x-ray on the left, look how they have to shift that talus forward like this, and they're almost on like the butt of the talus when they're in that degree of plantar flexion. That is a lot of tailor mobility that is required. And if you are too stuck in the mortise, you will never get that degree of plantar flexion. That degree of plantar flexion is also oftentimes achieved when you are at a younger age. So you'll have higher connective tissue pliability anyway to start, but it's just an important part of it. So now you don't need to get, you don't need a hundred degrees plantar flexion, but this is, this is more than a hundred degrees plantar flexion here, right? But if you want to get awesome plantar flexion, this is the way that I do it with patients and with clients. First, make sure that that talus is centered. So do the posterior band mobilization, myofascial release, the front of your leg, so that we are getting good extensibility of the muscles. They're not too tight. And then we want to gently stretch the anterior ankle and midfoot ligaments. Now you totally do not need to use a stretching device like what's right here. Um, this can, again, if you hold it too long, can cause uh, a lot of nerve stretching. So just be careful when you hold stretches, specifically with the feet, that you are not just stretching the tendons and the ligaments and connective tissue, but you are also stretching nerves. Okay. So very, very important. You do not want to stay too long in any position. If you are sitting on your feet to get plantar flexion, right? So think like a like a child pose and you sit up in like in yoga and you're plantar flexing your feet. Again, just be careful with those nerves. The nerves are very superficial on the top of the foot and you can easily compress them. And we don't want that. Okay. My final takeaway here is going to be the king of all foot exercises. This is really my upgraded short foot exercise. This is the ball between the heel exercise. Please, if you think you know the exercise, make sure that you are just watching because there's a few subtle details in here on how 
you get the most out of this exercise. And this is going to train plantar flexion inversion. And that's what we're training, plantar flexion inversion, because it's the inversion that creates the external rotation. Bam, get into your glutes. All right, so here we go. I'm going to take you through one of my favorite foot strengthening exercises, which is the ball between the heel, also referred to as an advanced short foot technique. Now, if you've seen this, maybe on social media, I want you to pay special attention to some of the slight subtle details that I'm going to show you in this exercise. What you need for this exercise is you want to be near a wall because you don't want to be challenging our balance. And you also need a ball. I have a narrow ball. You could use something like a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball. We're going to start by placing the ball on the floor between our heels. Now, something you want to be very careful of is you don't want to place the ball too high up so that it's underneath your malleoli or your ankle bones. There's some nerves that run through there, and we don't want to compress them in any way. So we're going to keep the ball on the floor in between our heel bones or our calcaneus. What we're going to do, and I'm going to have it rotated so I'm facing, and then eventually I'll turn to the side. But I want you to have your feet shoulder width apart. Find your foot to tripod, spread your toes nice and wide, and then we're going to start to slightly lift off of the floor. Now, as you start to lift, I want you to drive your heels together into the ball. As soon as you do that, you are going to activate the posture to the alex. Now, you're going to continue to drive your heels together, but now I want you to start to push your toes into the floor. That action of pushing your toes into the floor is kicking on your deep foot line through short foot. What you're going to do is continue pushing those toes down, driving the heels together, and you're going to lift, lift, lift all the way on top. And then on top, if you can see my heels, I want you to tuck your heels underneath the ball. And then you're going to find a neutral position and lower yourself back down. So again, slight lift of the heels, drive the heels together, push your toes into the floor, lift, 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 and then tuck your heels under the ball at the top of the raise, and then we slowly lower it down. Now, a couple extra things you wanna add into that is, as those toes push down, as the heels drive together, I need you connecting into your pelvic floor and your deep floor muscles. And then as you lift the entire time, you're going to be exhaling your breath. And then you will inhale on the way down, relax your feet, relax the deep core, reset, and then do it again. Lift, drive heels, toes down, lift pelvic floor, exhale all the way up, and then lower all the way back down. So I'm gonna show you from behind so you can see what is happening with my heel as I do this. And I'm gonna turn and face the wall, placing the ball between my heel, have good, nice postural alignment. The ball is just for balance. I'm not leaning into it. Spreading my toes, slight lift through the heel, drive the heels together, push my toes into the floor, connect into my abdominals, and then I'm going to lift, 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 tuck my heels at the top to really get a locked rear foot, and then find a neutral position, slowly lower down, and reset. Again, toes push down, slight lift, drive the heels together, toes continue down, lift, 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 tuck my heels under the ball, I feel it all the way into my glutes, and then slowly lower all the way back down. Good. So I want you guys to really, really appreciate that tuck on the top is really the most important part. I see a lot of people on social media, ball between the heel, and they're literally just doing calf raises. This is a foot to core exercise. It is a supination exercise. It's training the locking of the rear foot and really that joint coupling between inversion and external rotation. So just try to keep it as integrated as possible. Obviously the toes are down, the pelvic floor is lifting, the breath is exhaling. Uh, so it's really about the subtle little additions in the exercises that helps you get the most out of it. Okay. Yeah, on one side. Oh, one second. Sorry, you guys. Let's see. Move you forward. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Finally, some other ones when you are training that foot for power. 
uh, toe spacers, super, super important. The toe alignment is really important to acceleration, vertical jump. You need to make sure that you have an optimal toe purchase. So if they have hammer toes and bunions, you might need to use toe spacers to assist them. Short foot is really what those toes down pelvic floor, ball between the heel. We just did that. Uh, last one that I'm going to show you, which is my favorite, favorite new thing, is going to be using the wedges on the kinesis board. It is here. So I'm taking the toe wedge and I'm placing it on the kinesis board. And then I'm going into a position like this. And then this is how I'm going to train my ankle. Now, the reason why we want to do this is if you think about, let's say, ankle sprains, right? So ankle sprains, majority of ankle sprains are inversion ankle sprains, but an inversion ankle sprain is actually a plantar flexion inversion sprain. That's really what it's referred to, which means that we sprain our ankle when we are, let's say we're stepping off the curb. So you see, I have an element of plantar flexion and then I go like this, right? Or I'm stepping and I kind of misstep and I'm taking off, I'm plantar flex and I go like this, right? So plantar flexion inversion is the mechanism of an inversion ankle sprain. That means that when we rehab our ankles, we can't just do flat foot wobble board, flat foot Eric's pad, flat foot ankle stability. You got to get your ankle in a plantar flex position and do that instability training. So doing it in combination with something where your foot is propped up, this is going to start to challenge the stability of the ankle proprioceptors and mechanoceptors in a plantar flexed position, which that is really where it's going to transfer to walking and to ankle stability during dynamic movement. Okay, that's one of my, my new favorite additions for you guys. All right, so got some stuff for you and then we're going to go through some questions. I do apologize if it's a little bit longer than you guys anticipated. If you have to jump off, completely understand. I'm going to answer a couple questions and then I'll have to follow up with many of you via email. However, you want the Kinesis board, use code WEBINAR and that will get you 20% off the Kinesis board. So code WEBINAR, if you don't have the Kinesis board yet, micro wobble system, dual sensory system. We do have advanced wobbles that you can add onto it that are thicker and that are curved. So you can make this micro wobble system much more challenging. Otherwise, the board, 20% off. Head to naboso.com, use code WEBINAR. And then here we go again. These are my at-home program. So an at-home program for bunions, for big toe issues, hallux limitus, rigidus, for flat feet, and then for plantar fasciitis. So if you use code webinar, super easy, same code. Code webinar, you will get $50 off. So it's $50 for each of these programs. Again, there's six-week programs that take the patient through how to fix their flat feet, how to treat their plantar fasciitis. If you are a professional and you're just curious how I approach plantar fasciitis, this is essentially a great way to get the formula and how I approach those conditions. Head to dremilysplickle.com, look at the services, and you'll see at-home programs, and then just click use webinar to get $50 off. So that will be through the end of the month. So you got a week to do it. You got a week, you got a week. Here we go. And then finally, follow me on YouTube, all the different sites for programming. Or Naboso. Okay, so I am going to take exactly six minutes and answer some questions. Again, if you need to jump, I really appreciate your time. All right, Susan says, will these exercises exacerbate a tailor's bunion? So absolutely not. They should not. I would probably use toe spacers for that client, though, just to keep that fifth digit as aligned as possible is what I would be looking at. Uh, how can one rehab a chronic perineal tendon strain? If it is chronic, most likely there is a longitudinal tear. 
Oftentimes, this is a question by Catherine, I will actually do stem cell injections and some sort of regenerative approach before I do a lot of the proprioceptive rehab for that individual. So that's something that you can explore a little bit more and you can reach out to me offline if you would like. Um, can I treat a loss of proprioception with any of the Naboso products? So the way that I would address proprioception or a deficit in proprioception, let's say chronic ankle instability is technically an example of compromised proprioception. I would go after the mechanoception to offset the delayed proprioceptive response. Mechanoceptors are faster anyway. So that's where I would use the nerves in the bottom of the feet to essentially take the place and try to take some of that deficit. Okay. Um, let me see. If you are jumping on a reformer jump board, is that in a sense teaching joint position sense or perineal reaction time? Uh, yes. So uh, doing jumps on a jump board on reformer is requiring foot awareness, weight distribution, the timing of weight acceptance. Uh, if they land kind of kooky, uh, they, it should essentially stimulate a uh, sense that they are not centered in that landing technique. So yes, um, jumps on a jump board are great. Um, I would do them if they're having a hard time uh, feeling the landing, I would use maybe the Naboso socks. So it, it's triggering them and they feel their feet faster. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, some people say they have to leave. I totally understand. Um, Lee says, I, uh, I think a Naboso layer that one would add on top of a reformer jump board could be an interesting addition to the jump board practice. Yes. So um, just another Pilates question. What we've actually had is that people would take some of our mats and fold them over the jump board. We also sell sheet material. So if you guys did not know this, we sell sheets of our material and you can actually add it to a jump board. Board. It has an adhesive on the back. You can actually add it to anything that you want. Um, so just reach out to orders at Naboso if that is something interesting. But Lee, we are definitely aligned. Okay. Um, anonymous person says, what about shuffling as an older client? Shuffling is essentially telling you that they are never achieving plantar flexion, which means they're never achieving propulsion, which means they're not moving efficiently. They're probably moving slower. That is definitely a higher fall risk. So you definitely want to factor that in. Um, does your gait analysis program get into the big toe? Absolutely. But Susan, you may be curious to look at my Bunyan program. It's 50 bucks for nine videos about bunions and the programming that might actually really help you. Um, also, I have some lectures on teachable about the big toe. So definitely check that out. Um, Chris says, are you familiar with prolotherapy to treat bunions? Um, really? It's not treating the bunion, Chris. Um, prolotherapy is the injection of dextrose, which creates a scarring response. So I don't honestly know why they're using it in bunions. Um, you can send me more on that if you would like. Is there a weight limit on the kinesis board? Um, it exceeds over 300 pounds. So um, you should be good there. Do the wedges have the same surface texture as the kinesis board? Yes, actually all of the Naboso products have the exact same textures. You can see here, we actually got our patent. If you did not know that, we received our patent several months ago. So all of the products have now the Naboso patented texture. So it will always be that same pattern. Great question. Um, Am I anti-HOCA? <laughs> uh, so I will recommend HOCA for certain things. If they do have decreased perception of their foot awareness, I would for sure put the Naboso insoles in the HOCA because that's a lot of cushion and a lot of stack. Um, okay, so are you guys? Okay, I think this is almost everything. Uh, so vibration in our clinics would be the massage gun be useful instead of a force plate. Jerry asked this. Uh, so percussive therapy is not the same as vibration. What you can do is 
paint the surface of the foot. So just very lightly use the vibration of the percussive gun, or I would use vibration-based rollers. But percussive therapy is not the same as vibration therapy. Everything is based around frequency and the frequency and the amplitude is very specific on, on power plates and whole body vibration platforms, uh, which is speaking to the nervous system very specifically. Um, so just make sure you're very specific when you're doing that and you're not confusing the percussive with vibration. Okay. Awesome. All right, you guys. So there are so many more questions. I am going to have to respond to a lot of these via email. Thank you guys so much. Again, do follow me on Instagram, follow Naboso, check out the YouTube channels. Do make sure you head to Naboso, EBFA Global, my website. Do not forget about these codes. You get code webinar. Oh my goodness. You get code webinar on Naboso on my website. Thank you guys so much. I hope to see you on another webinar. Have an awesome day or night, depending where in the world you are. Take care.